We are beginning a new sermon series today that's going to run, I think, the course of the next six weeks or so, and we are entitling uh, this sermon series, Really? Exclamation point, exclamation point, question mark. It's based on an old Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live skit um, that Seth and Amy used to do, if you guys ever saw this, it was about 12 years ago, it's been a long time, and essentially what would happen is they would do it during Weekend Update, and they would look at the various news stories, and then with sort of shock and surprise and sarcasm, the punchline would be, really? Really? And uh, I looked up, I was going to play some of them for you guys, but because they're all 12 years old, they sort of didn't make any sense because they were all about politics from a long time ago. So the idea basically is, is this. Let me give you a couple of different examples of, of what they might have uh, sort of done there, Let me, or at least how this fits. And so the idea of this sort of sermon series is, again, shock, surprise. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And so here's one of the, the possible ways you, this could work out. Have you guys ever been through the self-checkout line at Kroger before? You know, you go through there. And every now and then, you know, the person in front of you pulls out, like, dollar bills and change, and you're waiting for that machine, and you're like, really? That's going to take a long time. That's the idea here. Okay. Or... Like me, you might be driving your 20-year-old Toyota Camry to Atlanta when you get pulled over for going 71 miles an hour, only to get passed by a Corvette going 90 miles an hour, and the response inside your head is, really? You know, can you not pull over the rich guy? Anyway, or the guy who's going 20 miles over the speed limit. Uh, Finally, and this is a true story, I don't know how many of you cut your fingernails outside, you should, or cut them over the toilet, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't, but occasionally you drop the fingernail clippers and they fall into the toilet, and your response is... Oh, really? You know, that's the idea. So I should not be a comedian, so please forgive me for all of that. That wasn't funny. Anyway, we're looking at various stories that we find in Scripture that would elicit the same response, that when you read a story of, you know, Jesus inviting a well-known skeptic to be one of His disciples, you go, really? Or you read about these Persian astrologers that we call the wise men, or the shepherds to herald Jesus' birth, and you go, really? What in the world? Today, we're going to be looking particularly at how God calls a murderer to be His servant. Before we do that, let's take a moment. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that uh, Your Word and the, the story of salvation and redemption is one that is surprising to us, just like a good movie, Father. It's not what we would expect, and that's a good thing. And so, Father, I pray today that we um, would see with new eyes your redemption, that we would see with new eyes your heart for sinful, broken people, Father. And I even pray that you would enable us to see our own sin, Father. We're not always so good at seeing that. And so, Father, I pray that we would see our own sin and we would take it to you. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1986, I was a freshman at Traveler's Rest High School. Many of you were not even born in 1986. But in 1986, there was no Netflix, there was no Amazon Prime, there was no YouTube TV. If you wanted to see a movie, you had to go to a movie theater. Or maybe you had a a, a VCR, and a VCR was this sort of machine, you plugged a giant tape in that was about the size of a book, and you watched a movie on it. At the end of it, you had to rewind it all the way to the beginning before you turned it back into Blockbuster, which is a place that used to rent these movies. Maybe I'm making sense to some of you. Maybe I'm not. Anyway, in 1986, there were actually quite a few great movies that came out. I can't list all of them, but I'm going to list a handful just to give you sort of a point of reference. Guess what came out in 1986? Top Gun came out in 1986. Wow. My dad was a pilot in the Navy and actually had his flight jacket, and I actually got to wear it right as, Tom, you know, right as Top Gun came out. Pretty cool. Or at least I thought I was. Anyway, uh, Stand By Me, if you guys have ever seen the movie Stand By Me, that came out in 1986. Ferris Bueller's Day Off came out in 1986, and the movie Hoosiers, if you're a basketball fan, came out in 1986. Good stuff. Now, What's interesting is that my favorite movie in 1986 was not Top Gun, it wasn't Stand By Me, it wasn't Ferris Bueller's Day Off, it was actually a movie called The Mission. It was a movie called The Mission. Some of you have heard of it, probably many of you have not, but it starred Robert De Niro, it starred Jeremy Irons, and then a very young Liam Neeson, if you guys are familiar with Liam Neeson. Now, ultimately, the story of the mission is about a, a number of different things. Like, it covers colonization, it covers, you know, slavery, it covers all these things, but it's really a story of redemption. Robert De Niro is really the main character in the movie. He plays 
a slave trader who violently captures and then sells uh, indigenous Paraguayans as slaves to Spanish plantations in South America. And so at the beginning of the movie, it does a great job of painting him as a really you know, dark, hostile character. And as depraved as that is, De Niro's character becomes even more despicable when he murders his own brother in a fit of jealousy. De Niro's character, Rodrigo, falls into a depression and he is inconsolable. He's, he's bitter, he's angry, he's despondent. And into this depression walks Father Gabriel, who's played by Jeremy Irons. Father Gabriel con- confronts Rodrigo not only about his vocation as a slave trader, but also about the murder of his brother. So he confronts him with the reality of his sin. He doesn't let it go. And so Rodrigo's response is to be bitter and really even hostile until Father Gabriel challenges him again, this time, however, not with his sin, but rather he challenges Rodrigo with the possibility of accepting forgiveness. The movie then takes a turn when Rodrigo accepts God's forgiveness and becomes a priest, and he begins to serve the very people that he used to enslave. It's a really a wonderful story of redemption. I do actually recommend it. Now, Christianity, as most of you in this room know, is a meta-narrative. In other words, it's a big story. It's a story of redemption, and it's comprised of smaller micro-narratives, that is, smaller stories of redemption. And so think about the story of Moses. Think about the story of Joseph. Think about the story of the woman at the well. Think about Mary Magdalene. Today, we're going to be looking into the story of the Apostle Paul, and particularly at his redemption. We're going to begin in Acts chapter 7, where we read of Paul's presence at the stoning of Stephen. So if you will, just jump in with me, and we're going to read a chunk of verses. Beginning in verse 57, Acts 7, they all rushed at him. That is sort of all these religious leaders and figures. They rushed at Stephen, they dragged him out of the city, and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so these religious leaders begin to stone this Christian man named uh, Stephen, And Saul is sitting there watching this take place. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then they fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now on to chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. So what do we see here? What do we take away from this story of Paul's redemption? I think the first thing we need to see in this story is actually the depth of the depravity of Paul's heart. Let's go back to verse uh, 57 of chapter 7, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. That is the religious leader stoning Stephen. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his uh, Roman name. And Saul, we see here in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of their killing him. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. I think there's an intentional contrast between those godly men and Saul. So we're first introduced to Saul slash Paul in the passage we just read about, and the introduction actually reveals quite a bit to us. In particular, we see something about his heart, maybe his internal world. We read there that Stephen, this Christian, this deacon, was brought before the Jewish religious leaders because he was talking about Jesus and they were trying to silence him. While standing before this religious council, he refused to back down, and instead he preached an impromptu sermon proclaiming that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So Stephen is bravely proclaiming Jesus in front of these religious leaders. And he goes on even to say that they, the religious leaders, were the ones who had murdered the Messiah. 
At this, the members of this religious council became enraged, the text says. They became furious with Stephen. They let him out of the city, and they began to stone him. And so what that means is they would have picked up baseball-sized rocks, and they would have begun pelting him, hitting him with these rocks until he died. Sounds horrific. In verse 58, we read that while they were stoning Stephen, that these religious leaders laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, that is, again, Paul that we read about later. Just for a moment, I want you to shut your, your eyes, and I want you to put yourself in Paul's shoes. Just think about this for a second. You're standing there, and you're watching these religious leaders. You know, their eyes are red, their teeth are gritted, they're furious, they're picking up rocks, they're throwing rocks at this person, and they're stoning him. How would you feel standing just steps away from this man who was having these stones hurled at him until he eventually stopped moving and died? My guess is that a few of us in this room, that very few of us in this room, could stomach watching an actual murder, especially the murder of a good person. Most of us would turn away. We, we really just couldn't watch. Some of us would literally become sick to our stomachs, and hopefully a few of us would try to intervene to stop such an atrocity, but not Paul. In fact, we read the following in verse 1 of chapter 8, and Saul approved of their killing him. Now, the Greek word for approved there is soon eudokeo, and it can mean approve, but it can also mean to take pleasure in or even to applaud. And so the question is, what kind of person would take pleasure in or would applaud at a brutal murder? What kind of person would you have to be? I think this passage reveals that something is deeply broken about Paul's heart. So what was, what was it? What was it about Paul? Was he uniquely broken? Was he uniquely damaged in some way? Maybe. Research shows that anywhere from 1% to 4% of the American population can be classified as sociopaths. That means that they don't feel empathy. Very few of them will ever actually commit crimes. But what it does mean is they don't feel pain. They don't feel empathy when someone else is suffering. And so you have to ask the question, was Paul a sociopath in this case? Maybe. History has recorded its fair share of sociopaths who have impacted the world. A quick study of Nazi Germany and communist Russia, however, will show that there are plenty of ordinary people who have engaged in unbelievably cruel behavior. This realization that ordinary people can be very cruel and very evil as well led Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the author of the Gulag Archipelago, to observe the following. He, he writes this in that book, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, not between classes, not between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. It's a great great quote. And my guess is that leading into 2024 especially, we would do well to remember his words. So immediately what we see in this passage is we see the depravity of Paul's heart. And we at least have to consider, based upon the rest of Scripture and this quote by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that there is a depravity that lies deep within our hearts as well, maybe more than we know, more than we're willing to admit. But there's more in this passage. We not only see Paul's heart, we also see the depravity of his plan, which I think is really jarring. If you look at verses 8, 1 through really 9, chapter 2, I'm going to read a couple of sections of these. And Paul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And so because of this persecution, everybody runs, they flee. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So he's systematically going around finding these Christians. Chapter 9, verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that was an early term for Christianity, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. A moment ago, I mentioned Nazi Germany. Now, part of what was remarkable about the Nazis was the depth of their cruelty. We, we know that. We've seen those movies. We've read those books. But what's also particularly jarring is the degree to which the evil of the Nazi uh, party was systematized. If you visit the National World War II Museum website, the very first sentence 
you see about the Holocaust is this. I'm going to read it. The Holocaust was Nazi Germany's deliberate, organized, state-sponsored persecution and machine-like murder of approximately 6 million European Jews and at least 5 million prisoners of war, Romanians, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, and other victims. So, just look for a moment at those descriptive words, deliberate, organized, machine-like. In other words, Hitler's evil heart worked itself out in the form of a plan. Very similar things could be said about Stalin and the gulags and Chairman Mao's cultural revolution. There was a a systematic outworking of evil in all of those those, uh, political regimes. Beginning in Acts chapter 8, we see the depravity of Paul's heart also blossoming into a plan. We're told in verse 3 of chapter 8 that Paul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. That sounds very systematic. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And then in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we read more. Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so what we see is that Paul is systematically seeking to eradicate all those who profess faith in Jesus. His evil has blossomed into a plan. I think it's fairly clear from these passages that something was, something was very deeply broken inside of Paul's heart. It would seem that he took, he took pleasure in watching Stephen die. The depravity of his heart then again became a plan to capture and kill women and men who were followers of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but if I had been around 2,000 years ago, I probably would have been praying that God would take Paul out somehow, maybe a bolt of lightning on the road, maybe cancer, maybe some robbers or thieves would kill him when they tried to, to steal from him. But what we see here in the rest of the story is that God had a very different plan for Paul, that God had a plan of redemption for this man. That's our next point. What we see here beginning in verse 3 is we see as he neared Damascus of chapter 9, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. So I just told you what my plan for Paul would have been, that God would just strike him dead. However, God had a very different idea. As Paul was traveling to Damascus for the purpose of capturing more Christians, a light flashed and a voice spoke. And when this happened, Paul fell to the ground, blinded, and as we'll see in just a moment, he was deeply changed. Now, in order to give you a little bit of a visual representation, uh, here's a painting by Caravaggio depicting this encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. I hope you can see it there. Paul is laying on the ground there at the bottom of the painting. In the painting, Paul lies vulnerable on his back, red robes spread out around him, his sword on the ground, and his hands raised upwards. It seems likely that the intent of the painting is to communicate that Paul's fight against Jesus had come to an end. In verse 4, this voice asks, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Clearly, the speaker knows Paul, but Paul doesn't know him. Clearly confused, Paul responds, who are you? And the answer he received would have been just as shocking to Paul as the blinding flash of light would have been. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I'm sure Paul would have been bewildered. He would have been shocked. He would have been incredulous. Jesus was dead. Paul had almost certainly watched Jesus die on the cross just a couple years earlier. And so you can just imagine Paul's head spinning, trying to make sense of what he had just heard. The voice then speaks again, this time saying, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Now, probably most of you in this room this morning know how this story ends. Paul surrenders his heart and his life to Jesus, and he becomes the most ardent missionary of the early church, traveling the Roman world, spreading the good news about Jesus, planting churches, and writing at least 13 of the different books that we read in the New Testament. And so God indeed had a plan for Paul's life, and fortunately for us, it was very, very different than my plan would have been. It was a plan of redemption. 
So the story of Paul reveals the depth of his depravity, but then his story also reveals that God has a plan for Paul's redemption and even for the spread of his kingdom. And perhaps the thing that we see most clearly in Paul's story, however, is the reality not of Paul's heart, but the reality of God's heart towards Paul and towards all sinners. That's our last point, is the reality of God's heart. If you read through Paul's letters, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, the list goes on and on, you'll get lots of theology. There's lots of deep theology there. Paul was, of course, a Pharisee. He was a scholar, and so his writings actually reflect that scholarship. But one thing you'll also notice is that Paul's theology doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not dry. It's not overly theoretical. It's concerned not only with the human experience, but it's always concerned also with the heart of God. Listen to some of Paul's most famous writings. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die, even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Paul's message here is that God loved you long before you got your act together. And again, he echoes that theme in Romans chapter 8. He echoes it also in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read chapter 2 of Ephesians verses 4 through 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. So when you were dead to him, he made you alive. His motive, because of his great love with which he loved us. So Paul's uncovering God's heart. In Romans 8, we read about the strength and faithfulness of that love for his children, beginning in verse 38. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does Paul reveal here about God's heart? That God's love not only engaged you when you were avoiding, even rebelling against Him, and that in His love He made you alive when you were dead, but also that now you have been adopted by Him, and so because you are His children, He will not, cannot give up on you. That's God's heart. You're now His child. Hear the words of Galatians 4. God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Because of God's great love, because of His heart, you no longer need to live like a slave, but instead you may live as a son, as a daughter, as a child of God. It's always interesting to me to see just to what degree our stories impact the way that we understand, the way that we see, the way we interpret, the way we experience God. As Jesus told the Pharisee about the sinful woman who, woman who anointed his feet, Jesus said this, "'Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little.'" I'm fairly certain the same can be said about Paul. A man who celebrated the murder of Stephen who actively hated Jesus and sought to destroy all those who followed him. And as a result of his story, Paul knew God's heart, a heart that loves powerfully, a heart that longs to forgive sinful people, and a heart that paid the ultimate price to be reconciled to his wandering